വീഡിയോ കാണുന്നുണ്ടോ ദീപക് സാറെ കാണുന്നുണ്ടോ റെഡിയാണ് കേൾക്കാമോ ദീപക് Good morning everyone. Today is the second day of a two day international webinar on a beginner's introduction to writing history. Today is our resource person is uh, Mr. Uh, A.M. Shinas. Uh, today he speaks on telescopic and microscopic view of history, contemporary pertinence, to, pertinence of local history. That's his topic. Uh, Mr. Shinas is a job department of history department. KKTM College Kodagandu. Uh, before we start, before we move to the resource person, we start, I invite our, my colleague, Dr. Binuam Jot, to go over his speech. Please, Binuam. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good morning. And uh, all are welcome to, our, uh, to the second day of our international seminar titled A Beginner's Introduction to Writing History. In the Namaka, Alaric Namaka Subari, Subari, Namla Samajatolam. Okay, today we are going to have a lecture from uh, Dr. Uh, A.M. Shinas. And uh, we are very familiar with uh, Dr. Uh, A.M. Shinas. And uh, he is the head of the Department of uh, History at KTM College. And uh, we have already had his uh, se uh, seminars, lectures before. And uh, he is a scholar who is theoretically very much immersed in uh, historical studies and uh, have been delivering several lectures uh, throughout Kerala. And he's a uh, writer too. And we are also familiar with his writings. He used to write in uh, different uh, journals and magazines about history. And today, fortunately, we are going to have a lecture titled <laughs> Telescopic and Microscopic View of History. contemporary pertinence of local history and uh, and we know that uh, he is going to deliver uh, a very useful lecture for our students who are actually studying about um, uh, local history and to further i would like to invite uh, dr k y shaju the vice principal of our college and uh, head of the department of physics and uh, further I would like to invite uh, all the students and scholars who are 
here to listen to the scholarly lecture by Dr. A. M. Shinas. Thank you very much. Mr. Deepak, may I start? Deepak, sir, your mic mute. Yes, yes. Sorry. Next, I invite our beloved vice principal, Dr. K. Y. Shahju sir, for uh, felicitation talk. Please, K. Y. Shahju sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. A very warm good morning to all from Christ College, Irinjalakuna. Today's resource person, Mr. A. M. Sinas, head of the Department of History, KKTM College, Kodungalur, and head of the Department of History, Christ College. This is Lisha KK, Dr. Binu M. John, and Dr. C. Vidya V, and other faculty members, and my dear participants. I think History Department of Christ College is making another history by conducting the maximum number of webinars in this academic year. And I especially congratulate the History Department and the team for such a wonderful performance. And I guess physics department is the second one in the number of webinars. And uh, being a member of physics department, uh, myself, a science teacher, I am speaking a very little about some of the aspects of history. It is often contended by certain critics that one should be interested in the living at present and not in the dead past. This is a very erroneous and dangerous view. Most of the problems which confront us today have their roots in the past. So the study of history is in any branch of the knowledge is very important. It is an unending dialogue between past and present. If somebody asks the question, what is the use of history? He is like asking, what is the use of experience? History is the summarized experience of society. We know that history makes us understand that neither success nor failure is everlasting. It teaches us moral lessons. It helps to gain powers of memory, imagination, and reasoning. It fosters patriotism in our youth. It gives the human beings a mental discipline and a cup to face new problems intelligently. J.B. Burry, the celebrated professor of history of Cambridge University said that history is a science. The aim of both history and science is the same, which is the establishment of truth. Like science, history deals with the nature because man is the greatest work of product of nature. Science adopts inductive logic, while history uses deductive logic. That is one of the major difference. But both science and history depends on observation and experimentation. The aim of science is to predict the future, and the history also will not fail in this aspect. The only difference to the answers is that 
the answers to scientific questions are the same everywhere in the universe but in history it is may be different because history deals with the human beings and science deals with the natural uh, non living things and uh, their phenomena local history should be taught in history programs or courses because it enables students to investigate and learn geography and to get an insight into our culture and to form connections between past and present while writing history the historians always concentrated on the role of leaders nobles etc and neglected the role played by the local population in different events study of local history helps us to get information about minute or tiny incidents that shaped history history is the register of man's struggle for progress and freedom it is a, it is a teacher of what our forefathers have to give to their successors so a microscopic study at the events are very important to understand our own culture social values the experiences of the poor and the powerless in our society i i know that is the words uh, microscopic and telescopic are derived from science especially from physics uh, and i i wonder why you are not using macroscopic the word macroscopic and using telescopic telescopic means a, a, a view from a very far away it is surprising to note that how little people appear to profit by it past errors are repeated again and again as hegel rightly pointed out that the one thing we learn from history is that nobody ever learns anything from history history has lessons to offer but the lessons cannot be forced on an unwilling and unwise minds so with these words once again i congratulate the department of history for conducting such a wonderful international webinar and i i i, I know that dr uh, mr shinas is a very competent theoretician in history and uh, uh, very lovely to watch his speak speech i also wish the participants to interact freely during the discussion hours and make take maximum advantage of this webinar once again wishing you all the success and wish you a very good day with the fine deliberations thank you very much from the grace college management and thank you very much for inviting me and once again i wish all the success to the webinar thank you and jai hind over to you sir okay thank you very much dr shaju kevay sir for your wonderful lecture next uh, i invite our today's uh, uh, not okay. speaker Dr. Professor M. Shinas, and today is going to present on telescopic and microscopic view of history, contemporary pertinence of local history. Then, uh, Professor Professor Shinas, Shinas, sir, floor is yours. Please welcome. Welcome, uh, welcome. Yes, yes, you are clear. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaju K. Y. Uh, Mr. Yeshua and Anthony, and all the faculty of the Department of History, 
Christ College in Nagpur. I'm grateful to the Christ College, which is one of the most reputed institutions in Southern Kerala, and the Faculty of PG Department and Research Department of History for inviting me to deliver a talk on local history. As the title itself indicates, telescopic and microscopic view of history. What I mean is, by telescopic view, uh, historians, old, old historians, researchers, view history in terms of uh, national history or global history, history of larger structures and larger movements, larger areas such as nation or a global history, or even uh, the history of Kerala falls into a uh, telescopic view of history. That is, even though it is a region, regional history, provincial history. By local history, uh, microscopic, that is minute details of a very small unit is considered. So let me come to the point later because the first use of the term terms microscopic view and telescopic view of history was used in, ex in an exchange between the late Eric Hobsbawm. Eric Hobsbawm died in 2000, 2012, if my memory is uh, correct. In 2012, uh, he was one of the uh, greatest British Marxist historians and a very renowned historian of the world history. His series like Age of Capital, Age of Empire, Age of Extremes, Age of Revolutions, and even uh, History of Jazz, Primitive Rebels, and many more. And there was an exchange between uh, Lawrence Stone, who is also a British, British historian. And in that exchange, in that conversation, uh, propped up these terms, telescopic view, and microscopic view of history. I will come to that later. Before that, uh, local history has gained, gathered unprecedented momentum in recent decades uh, for precisely uh, since the last two decades of this, uh, two decades from the end of the 20th century and in the uh, first and second decades of the 21st century, local history has gained unprecedented or uh, very uh, uh, unusual momentum in recent years. And some scholars are of the view that local history and globalization working tandem, working tandem, work together, uh, each complementing other. And other more sober scholars, more studied, more learned. Globalization actually destroys local culture, local practices. And that is that globalization as a global process homogenizes all cultures. It obliterates, eliminates, it, uh, it extinguishes local cultures and local uh, practices and local forms and local identity in a very uh, hasty uh, manner. So local uh, globalization is actually in fact a destroyer of local identity, local culture and local practices. It in fact ossifies, in, fa in fact fossilizes local culture, local history, and local, all forms of local practices. So the retrievement or the emergence of local history is uh, at the same time, it is a resistance against globalization. And it is a fight against globalization's homogenizing tendencies, which tend to destroy local cultures, not only in Kerala, but all, all over the world. So let me come to the 
predecessors or precursors of local history. We, the students of history, are familiar with Annals Movement or Annals School, which is also known as the French Historical Revolution, which emerged in France in 1929 with the publication of the journal Annals of Economic and uh, Economic and Social History. Annals of Economic and Social History. And the journal editors were historians Mark Bloch and Lucien Febvre. So with this publication on 1st January 1929, uh, Annals Movement or Annals School for French Historical Revolution, as it is also known, emerged on the scene. Before the emergence of Annals School, most of the historians, most of the, not all, most of the historians were preoccupied, engaged in writing political, diplomatic, and military history. For them, uh, the domain of political history was, the, was of paramount importance. And all other aspects of history, they overlooked all other aspects of history, or they marginalized, or they, they, have, they had given uh, least emphasis uh, for all other aspects of history, except political history. So political history was at the center stage of historical study during the 19th century. That emphasis, that importance to political history was changed with the emergence of Annals School. I'm saying the, uh, I'm describing the emergence of Annals of Schools because a local history has some connections with Annals of School and the micro history that emerged in uh, Italy in the 1970s. So I will go to, I'm going to the second phase of the Annals of School, second generation of the Annals of School uh, and the third generation uh, were so many micro histories were produced and uh, also the Italian pioneers of local history, Carlo Ginsberg and Levy, who started local uh, micro historical writing, which is indeed local history. But there is, there is some uh, differences between uh, the prevailing, prevalent local history and micro history practiced by Italian historians and micro history uh, practiced by the Annals historians of second and gen third generation schools. So Annals school actually what they did was uh, one of the major preoccupation with Annals school was a problem oriented analytical approach to history. Instead of history of events, history of events means history of polit political history. So this timeline marginalized or completely overlooked, ignored political history and brought in social and economic history to the center stage of history. So the approach to history was problem oriented and Lucien Febvre uh, famously remarked that no problem, no history. If there is no problem, no history. So another feature of Annals movement was they they were thoroughly interdisciplinary in approach, interdisciplinarity. So we know about so many disciplinarities today, nowadays, interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinary studies, cross-disciplinary studies, and, and many types of inter or multi or cross or transdiscipline studies. For transdiscipline, it is very easy to explain, for example, if a student of history combines or studies physics or chemistry or zoology, which is perceived as uh, diametrically opposite to the, to the discipline of history, that is transdisciplinary approach, which can shed illuminating insights into the subject matter, what he or he, she studies. And cross disciplinary is same as uh, trans, uh, somewhat same as transdisciplinary. Multidisciplinary means the gathering of uh, two or three or many more subjects around one discipline and drawing insights from 
those disciplines, which actually enriches the parent discipline, whether it is history or economics or anthropology or any pure science subjects. And interdisciplinarity is very different. And for many people confuse uh, interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity because these two terms, these two practices are entirely different in the sense that uh, Roland Barth, one of the famous French uh, post-structuralist thinker, he was, uh, he was in the beginning a structuralist thinker, then turned to uh, become a post-structuralist, post-modern thinker later in the 1960s. So he defined interdisciplinarity in a very uh, interesting way, uh, in a very accessible way. That is, according to him, to study, to study interdisciplinarity, or to, uh, if you are making an interdisciplinary uh, work or study, you are not simply gathering two or three or four or more, more subjects around one discipline. It is actually not that. You are, you are, you are in fact gathering all these disciplines. Okay, you are taking insights, concepts, theories, and others from these whole disciplines. But the final ultimate product or ultimate object of, an, of any interdisciplinary work is an object which belongs to none of these disciplines, including the parent discipline. If I or any other researcher is doing interdisciplinary research in history, that means that my final product is not at all related to, not only related to history, but, but also not related to other disciplines which I, have, I had consulted. So the final product or the final object of interdisciplinary research is actually a production of an object which belongs to none of this discipline. This is the core, the kernel of interdisciplinarity. I don't think many, many around us uh, have understood the true real meaning of interdisciplinarity. That is why I explained this, this formulation of Roland Barthes. So then uh, the uh, contribution was uh, total history. That is the second generation analysis historian, Fernand Browden uh, advocated total history. That is the investigation of whole range of human activities not a specific aspect of human activity, or politics, or diplomatics, or economic activities, whole range of human activities into the realm of history. That is total history. And they also devised a new concept of time. We, uh, we have known two types of uh, historical times. One is, one, one is linear time, that is from past, present to future linear. The other time, other time concept is cyclical, birth, uh, youth, like that, cyclical, death, uh, cyclical view of time. And according to analysis historians, the time is multi-layered, or time is three-layered, three-layered time. Time, time is three-layered means that uh, time has three layers, and these three layers of time are moving in different speeds. For example, long theory, long-term time, that is uh, geological time or geographical history. That layer of time is very slow moving. That is why it is also known as stationary history. The second layer of time, level of time, is known as medium theory, that is medium term time. It is also known as social time. In this framework of time, uh, analysis historians include social and economic trends and changes, which takes medium time, uh, more or less 50 or 100 years. The, the last layer of time is political time or short duree or short term time. In that level of time, time is very, very fast moving. Time is very swift, politically, you know, we all know that political changes are very swift. In Bihar, to, uh, the, tomorrow or day after tomorrow, a new government 
will be sworn in. A new uh, chief minister will be sworn in. So political changes are abrupt, very swift, very fast. So uh, Fernand Brothers title of the work, major work, seminal work is Mediterranean and the Mediterranean world in the age of Philip II. So look at this very title, Mediterranean and the Mediterranean world in the age of Philip II. Mediterranean denotes geography, geographical time, Mediterranean landscape, that is, that includes Mediterranean sea, rivers, plains, mountains, flora, fauna, and everything. The second uh, uh, Mediterranean world, Mediterranean and the Mediterranean world denotes Mediterranean society. That is the social time, medium term time or medium during. Philip II is a political figure. He was a king of Spain. And that represents political time or short during. So they conceived time as a multi-layered uh, with differing speeds, differing velocities. So they also were of the view that political time is insignificant in history. For example, uh, Fernand Brosel wrote this seminal work, very important work of the 20th century in a German prison. He was uh, imprisoned during the Second World War in a German prison for five years. And during these five years, he prepared, he wrote 90% of the work. That is more than six lakh words, six lakh words. And the first 400 pages of the book deals with the Mediterranean world, Mediterranean land, landscape, Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean Sea is the major protagonist of this 400 pages. So one of the major criticisms against this work is this work, Mediterranean, even though uh, many people claim it has seminal work, is a work, a historical work without people. So the first 400 pages is absolutely devoid of any people or any man or woman. So uh, they paid great emphasis, great attention, great importance to geographical factors of history. So these first 400 pages were so uh, we look, you look at, it, at, your, at our test books in the history or Kerala history. The uh, geography, geography is only a background, only a one, uh, one chapter, three or four pages. For example, Kerala owes much, much to his, its history, to geography. Without Arabian Sea and Western Guards, there is no Kerala as such now. The Kerala's religious demography, religions, uh, the Kerala culture, its uh, symbiotic nature, uh, a very, the very Kerala identity was actually uh, uh, formed, actually was uh, shaped by geographical factors, Arabian Sea and Western Ghats. The first Semitic religions, for example, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, etc., first arrived in India in Kerala, not in other parts of the world. So uh, Kerala has much indebted, Kerala's history and Kerala, Kerala's identity has much indebted, in indebtedness to uh, geographical factors, geographical surroundings. If we had been a landlocked area, our history would have been different. Think about it. So, uh, and another point is all the Alliance historians were uh, engaged, but, uh, they concentrated on the medieval period, especially European history. And most of the Alliance historians, except, except one or two, were non-Marxist in their approach. They were, uh, they were not openly against Marxism, but they simply did not follow Marxist approach in history. Only except uh, uh, one or two uh, later analysis historians. So uh, I described all this, all, all this about analysis history, analysis movement 
because one of the major analysis historians of the second generation, and we can include his uh, him in third generation too, that is Emmanuel Roy Ladori. His two books, The Peasants of Languedoc and Montello, these are the two book, books about Languedoc is a French village and Mondello is a French village. So uh, it is uh, the history of the peasants in the French village Languedoc. And Mondello is another village and it is the history of uh, Mondello village. So we can rightly uh, uh, assign this as local history or micro history, but uh, local history and micro history has certain differences, which I will explain after some time. So after that, after that, in 1970s, micro history, a new branch of history known as micro history emerged in Italy. The pioneers of micro history in Italy was Carlo Ginsburg and Levy, Giovanni Levy, Levy. And we all know that the, at least the students of uh, postgraduates, postgraduate students and the teachers are well familiar with Carlo Ginsburg's famous work, Cheese and Bones, uh, Life of a 16th Century Miller in Italy, Menaccio. For well, Menaccio was uh, considered as a heretic. So the establishment, religious establishment persecuted him and finally burned him. So it is a micro history of a heretic in a French village uh, named Menaccio. And he was burned uh, because of his her heresy. Uh, this is uh, actually uh, falls into micro history. And uh, another one of the most interesting micro histories of this genre, this type of uh, micro history is uh, Natalie uh, Simon Davis, an American Canadian historian, who uh, her work is one of the famous work, which has been made into a made, in, made a cinema too, uh, is the return of Martin Gale. Uh, the French pronunciation is Gale. The spelling is G U E R R E. Martin Gale. So Martin Gale was actually a native of Basque. Basque is a territory between Spain and France and uh, in his childhood, Martin Gare and his family moved to another village in France. So they changed the family name to Gare. The family name was not Gare. So in order to adapt and in order to assimilate uh, with that village culture. So they successfully assimilated with the new culture. They, lang they le learned the local language and, the, and the, at the age of 14, Martin Gale uh, married from a well-off family and her name was Bertrand. And uh, he married, he stayed with her for eight years. And uh, when he was, uh, after eight years, uh, they had a uh, son. And one day after quarreling, uh, after quarreling with his father, uh, Martin Gale, suddenly disappeared. For eight years, for a long eight years, there was no information about Martin Gay. So according to canon law, his wife cannot remarry. And they had a son too. So what happened in 1548, Martin Gay disappeared. He went to Spain, joined a cardinal's army, then joined a noble's army, and in the war, his leg was seriously injured and it was amputated. So he was in that condition and no, no, nobody knew about his plight in his own village, including his family. So in 90, after three years, an imposter, imposter means Kapadavesha, Martin Luther, Baba Hava the Gulum Luba Pragurdo Mulla, Kapada Prachen Naveshada, imposter from a neighboring village appeared in uh, Martin Luther's village, Martin, uh, Martin Luther's Martin Gale's village. Uh, he was similar, he had similar look 
Arnold was his name. Arnold, a French pronunciation. Arnold. So uh, he has uh, somewhat similar looks, and uh, he learned about Martin Gale uh, about some passenger from some passengers passing through his village. They told about Martin Gale and his disappearance and the plight of the uh, 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 widowed. In fact, not widowed, of uh, plight of the Martin Gale's wife. She belongs to a well-to-do family. So this imposter was a criminal. Actually, he was uh, uh, he was fond of gambling, drinking, and all, all other sorts of things. So he decided uh, to appear in Martin Gale's village as Martin Gale, because Martin Gale left when he was at the age of 20 or 21 or so. Uh, he was wandering all across uh, Spain, uh, severely injured, uh, legs amputated, and after this, uh, this fellow had similar look, almost similar looks of that of Martin Gale. So he appeared in the village and claimed, I am Martin Gale. I want to live with Martin Gale's, the real Martin Gale's wife. First, Martin Gale's wife and his family were, were confused. Later they thought that, ah, it is almost, uh, okay, it is almost, almost already eight years or so. So something might have been changed in his appearance. So, he, so his wife accept, accepted him. They lived together for three years and had two, uh, one son and one daughter. And at the same time, this Martin, this uh, fraud Martin Gale claimed ancestral property of Martin Gale, which belonged to Basque region of France. So uh, Martin Gale's uncle, Pierre Gale, uh, began to suspect the fraud Martin Gale. Is it real Martin Gale or not? He investigated thoroughly and find out, found out that this fraud is a fraud. He is not real Martin Gale. He belongs to this village and uh, he has so many vices, so many, he, he is not a good personality. So he tried to convince the real Martin Gale's wife that he is not the real Martin Gale. He is cheating you at first. The wife of real Martin Gale did not accept. She said, no, he is the Martin Gale. I don't want to leave him. I want to lead a uh, comfortable family. He's treating me very well. No, she said. After so many persuasion, uh, she agreed uh, to give her uh, version in the court. In the lower court, uh, after many uh, witnesses, after hearing many witnesses, the judge uh, ordered beheading of Martin, the fraud Martin Gale, beheading. And Martin Gale appealed to the higher court. The higher court also uh, had more than 150 witnesses. They, some witnesses favored the fraud Martin Gale, he is the real Martin Gale, they said. Other witnesses, including the family, Martin Gale's real Martin Gale's family, uh, witnessed that he is a fraud. And finally, what happened was a dramatic appearance of amputated real Martin Gale into the court. Court and all the spectators in the court stunned the real Martin Gale amputated legs. He appeared in the court and said to judge, I am the real Martin Gale, not this man. And the court was astonished. And the court finally come to the conclusion that the fraud is a fraud. And the real Martin Gale is the amputated man. So the court ordered to kill Martin Luther, the fraud Martin Gale, that is Arnold, 
in front of Martin Gere's house. That hanging took place in 1960. So this is an event. This is an event of ordinary people. So my, it, it is also known as one of the finest works of micro history. And uh, interestingly, Simon Davis says that this real Martin Gale's wife, Berthold, actually knew that the fraud meant Martin Gale was a fraud. She was convinced about it. But she uh, wanted to live a family life in, that, in such a uh, conservative society. So he was also behaving uh, with her very pro properly. So she wanted to continue that life. Uh, uh, writes uh, Simone, uh, Simone Davis. Uh, so there is actually disputations about it, about this. There, her version is like that. So this is micro history actually refers uh, history of an individual or an event or a small community at a particular moment of history in greater detail, which unravels, uh, which, which, which reveals the uh, general social setting and social circumstances and social conditions, including religious beliefs and uh, other mentalities of the people, uh, etc. cetera. That, uh, that is uh, limited to not a small territory or, or small unit. Often, for example, in Chis and Worms, uh, Carlo Jin's work, uh, protagonist is a Miller, 16th century heretic. Uh, Miller uh, Menuccio. In this case, Martin Gale and his family, and and many other cases. So, microhistory deals with an event, or an individual, or a particular small community at a particular uh, historical moment in greater detail. But local history is also microhistory. Is also microhistory. But the difference is. Local history is micro history indeed, but located in the context of the macro. We cannot miss the macro context that I will come to later. In micro histories, uh, you uh, may not, or you should not, or you may not uh, contextualize. You cannot, uh, you may not relate the macro context with micro context with macro context. You, cannot, you may not interrelate micro and macro. You, uh, you may not contextualize micro in the context of macro, but in local history, one of the most vital cardinal point is you have to contextualize micro with macro. Otherwise, my, the local history will become, local history would become unconnected, a series of unconnected histories of different localities. So what are the salient features of local history? Local history salient features, characteristic features are local history is not self-contained, not self-contained. It is always, as I said uh, now, it is always a part of a larger Thing, a larger structure, larger context that, that is macro history. So therefore you, you cannot explain uh, micro history or local history. It is indeed without contextualizing, without taking into the context of the larger structure. For example, you cannot uh, write a meaningful, a very uh, good local history of a village uh, without taking into the context of the panchayat in which the village is located, the district in which the, in which the, uh, the set panchayat is located, the state in which the district is located, and the uh, country in which the state is located, and the country in which the world is located. So local history is indeed micro history, but it is in the context of macro history. But it should be located in the context of macro. And other features of local history is there is no hierarchy in historical writings, local historians would say. Uh, many people think that local history is very easy to write because it, it is local in nature, because you are dealing with a very small unit, not 
act like that. And even professional historians like Dr. Kane Panikar are of the view that local history writing is a tedious task, very important, very difficult, very complex, very vexatious task, because even though it, even though, for example, village or panjayat or any other type of unit, smaller unit, uh, you should be well grounded in historical method, sophisticated, sophisticated rigor, uh, methodological rigor, empirical uh, richness, and all uh, process of methods of historical writing. Besides that, besides that, you should note a local history enterprise is a interdisciplinary enterprise. It is interdisciplinary in nature that a mere, if you know mere history, only history, if you don't know geography. Uh, so local history is an interdisciplinary exercise in the sense that you need the service of geographers, soil experts, archaeologists, epigraphists, ge uh, geologists, and all types of such specialists to analyze the landscape, flora, fauna, the uh, inscriptions, archaeological remains, the nature of the soil, and all other features of the locality. So local history is a thoroughly interdisciplinary exercise. You cannot uh, 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 write local history in that sense. So I may recall uh, the emergence of the professional uh, field of local history in Britain. For example, local history first emerged in Britain. It is emerged in Britain in the early, century, early decades of the 19th century because of industrialization and the resultant urbanization and the consequent disruption of local localities, local cultures, and local practices. Uh, what is we are witnessing in the era of globalization now? So in, during the beginning of industrialization, during the beginning of 19th century, industrialization resulted in a growing urbanization and growing urbanization and industrialization combined uh, disrupted local cultures, local landscapes, local practices. So uh, there emerged an, uh, a requirement to conserve local identity, local culture, local practices. That was the uh, emergence of local history in the Great Britain. But during that time, local history was actually practiced by untrained amateur historians. So the uh, pitfalls and limitations are evident because you are untrained in historical method, you cannot write good history. One of the uh, most fundamental uh, quality to write history is whatever your, your ideological leanings or political biases, you should be well trained in historical method. If your historical method is correct, your history is 80% uh, okay. Then remains the subjectivity is always a part and parcel of history. You cannot avoid subjectivity and every history, including local history, is subjective in nature. So the subjectivity creeps, creeps into the domain of history every time, every period, you, uh, you, uh, always. For example, Rank, the great German historian, Leopold von Rank, uh, famously declared that the historian's primary duty is to show what it really was, what it really was, to find out what it really was. <laughs> we know that even Rang's works, Rang's works are highly subjective. Highly subjective. When he writes about Italy, he's a German nationalist. So you cannot be subjective in political sense or in uh, ideological sense some subjective factors like religious bias, caste bias, patriotic, jingoistic bias, regional bias, and there are so many biases and prejudices which uh, influences historians. So you cannot be objective. So uh, there cannot be in a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy. Uh, for example, the first official local history department was emerged in Britain in Leicester School. 
Leicester University in 1948, uh, the Department of Local History, Department of Local History. I don't think even today in Kerala, there is no a distinct department, department for local history. Even today, we are doing local history. Our students are doing dissertations on local history subjects. That is, uh, that is a fact, I agree. But we don't have a distinct, separate university department for local history. Such a department of local history was created in 1948 by uh, British historians S.P.R. Finberg and W.G. Hoskins. S.P.R. Finberg and W.G. Hoskins, these were the pioneers of English local history. And local history uh, had become a professional branch of history. Uh, before that, local history was um, mainly practiced by amateur, untrained historians, uh, untrained uh, writers. So local history was considered as inferior, lacking methodological rigor, sophistication, and empirical richness, whatever right. And local history uh, often turned out to become miniature copies of uh, national histories or regional histories, uh, which consists chapters like economy, geography, culture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Miniature copies of uh, Kerala history or miniature copy, copies of Indian history in general. Uh, local history has become like that, had become like that. So uh, during that years in the 1948, in the 1940s and 1950s in Britain, SPR Finberg famously lamented, Sangara Tholapan, famously lamented that local history has been treated like Cinderella by the professional academic historians. Local history has, been, has not been uh, granted full-scale citizenship in the historical field. About SPR Finberg lamented that local history is just like Cinderella. You know the story of Cinderella. And local history was at that time, uh, like Cinderella, treated, uh, overlooked, ignored by everyone. So it did not gain full class first class citizenship, full citizenship uh, during that period, he lamented. But things changed. After uh, 1970s and 1980s, local history gained prominence in the West, in Europe, in America, and during the People's Plan movement in the 1990s in Kerala, many local histories had been written, many local sources, including uh, family histories, legends, fables, tales, Etc. were collected, and uh, uh, and, uh, and and a few uh, books of standard local history, I say, uh, have been written in Kerala. Standard, few, two or three books of standard local history. Others are like this. Others are amateurish uh, adventures, amateurish enterprises, and local history. Uh, view the past uh, from top down, not from, from, not from below up. Local history views view the past from top down and not top down. Well, traditional history or uh, all other histories or mainstream histories views from national history or global history views pass from top to down. But local history views from below, from below, not above. That is one of the major difference uh, of local history. And local history is often regarded as not serious even by professional academic historians, even while they were using local history, oral sources, oral traditions in the works. That is an irony. Uh, and another uh, problem with local history is how you define a locality. What is a locality? For some, for locality is many things to many people. For some, it is a village. Some, it is an administrative unit like a panjayat. For some, it is a provincial history. For others, it is uh, a locality sharing common uh, culture and common environmental features. 
uh, like that, markers like that. For others like environmental markers or cultural markers, administrative markers, the problem with administrative markers is that village boundaries and panchayat boundaries and even district boundaries have been redrawn uh, continuously in India. So uh, we don't have a uh, village or panchayat that exists from time immemorial. So that is the problem with the administrative division. Then we can identify certain common cultural traits and environmental characteristics. So you have to define a locality first. And then the first thing to start with local history is to find out the origin of place names. Well, place names opens window into a larger cultural world. Well, place names are actually cultural product. Ashari Kandi, Ashari Pura. There are so many place, place names uh, which, which, which are related to occupation. So uh, you have to start your local history with place names. I'm not going to the methodological aspects of lo local history uh, more. And, and, and uh, we have to remember in mind that, always bore in mind that loc uh, any, local, any locality, a locality of the past or present is not static. It is, all it is always changing. It is not static. It is not unchanging. It is al always on the move. It's, it is always incorporating, always assimilating uh, new uh, value systems, new cultures from adjacent uh, features. In the uh, age of globalization, that assimilation and incorporation is unprecedented, very fast. Uh, uh, one or two centuries before, uh, uh, some localities were self-contained, isolated, we can say. Even so, Didi Kosambi and others have pointed out, had a pointer out that no society, no region, no culture in India was static or uh, changeless or stationary, as postulated by the Asiatic mode of production. And geography is one of the driving forces in shaping history and local history uh, gives uh, much emphasis on geographical factors. And local history demands what? Uh, demand an explicit geographical cause and effect uh, uh, relationship. And local history is very important because uh, most of the histories, for example, even it, uh, it is a history of a smaller un unit were written by using sources of the privileged, more articulated, more dominant people of the locality. Often uh, and always, if not always, the voices of the ordinary, voices of the marginally, marginalized people were ignored. So local history, since it is a democratic enterprise, because it needs the participation of the people. Only an historian cannot do local history. You, uh, you have to use oral traditions, oral history and legends, etc. For oral history, you have to interview a group of people individually and collectively. For oral traditions, you have to meet people, elderly people, for, uh, for collecting legends, you have to meet the people. So local history without local participation is impossible. So it is a collective enterprise. And so it is a democratic enterprise. So uh, local history, uh, the main sources of <clears throat> one of the most fundamental problem with local history is that when you do a local history, most often uh, PhD scholars, PhD researchers are uh, persuaded uh, not to do local history because you don't, you, you may not find uh, a lot of sources. If you do exam, if you do something like other areas, you can fi find uh, ample 
uh, number of sources and, and your research will become easy. So many people are disordered or persuaded even from doing local history because of the scarcity of sources. Actually, that is a fact. Uh, conventional documentary archival sources are very rare for local history writing. So we have to tap, we have to uh, find out unconventional sources. And the major unconventional sources for local history writing is oral traditions. Oral traditions is uh, oral, uh, that is memory, individual, uh, individual and social memory transmitted from generation to generation. During this transmission process, several factors influences this uh, memory, social as well as individual memory, ideological factors and other factors mediate this transition. And the final uh, transmitted product will be entirely different from uh, the original uh, popular memory of the event. So local historians will be, uh, should be very cautious in uh, separating the real history from the popular and individual accounts. Some individuals, for example, actually may be uh, witness to an event or a participant in that event. He may distort, he may exaggerate, or he, he may romanticize, or he may belittle that uh, event for his own personal or ideological purpose. So uh, when you interview a person, you should be very cautious so oral history, oral historical practice also demands some methodological uh, grounding. For example, you have to read Paul Thompson's edited work, The Oral History Reader. Paul Thompson and uh, another of his colleagues edited a work known as Oral History Reader. Because oral history and oral traditions and let very, very important for local historical uh, uh, writing, they are the uh, base, basic sources of local history writing. I, I do not so, uh, say that there are no documentary or archival, archaeological, epigraphical sources. There indeed, in India, there indeed are. But these two sources are to be compiled, complemented, and and you have to uh, uh, bring out an excellent work on local history, which is a thoroughly, uh, uh, what, thoroughly uh, democratic enterprise. And, and I come to the last point, because I have an exam duty today. Uh, the last point, telescopic and microscopic. What are the advantages, telescopic and microscopic? So I told you in the beginning, beginning an exchange between Eric Hobsbawm, one of the leading historians of, uh, of the world, and a British Marxist historian, and he was one of the founders of the British Marxist Historians Group, which initiated history from below, from 1950s onwards. So in exchange between Lawrence Stone, he's also a British Marxist historian, uh, they shared about the narratives of history, narration of history. Uh, they were talking about the uh, narrative history. At that time, Eric Hobsbawm said that uh, the types of micro history uh, written by Laduri or Ginsburg are not unimportant. They are important. They are micro history. They are local history indeed. They are micro history. And uh, micro history uh, should be located in the context of the macro. So micro history is actually teles a microscopic view of history. That is a small unit of a uh, region you are investigating in a very detailed manner. That is microscopic. So it is important in history. But Henry Wolfsburg emphatically says that the need of the microscope doesn't make telescope irrelevant, unimportant. Microscope and telescope in telescope is you, if you investigate a larger, larger region, larger structure, or, or a history of a nation state, global history, or history of Kerala, you are using telescope, not microscope. These are complementary. 
So uh, the need for microscope do not uh, does not diminish the need for telescope. And inverse, inversely, the need for telescope do not uh, does not diminish the importance of uh, microscope. They are complementary. So the point is, local history is not localized history. The distinction is very important. Local history is not localized history in the sense that if you approach local history from the viewpoint of a locality, a locality perspective, a narrow-minded perspective, if you do not connect your local history with broader histories outside, which are indeed related, your history is history will become, if such histories proliferate, such histories will become unconnected series of uh, histories, which has, uh, which have no meaning. So local history is not localized history. Localized history is you are uh, studying a locality with a very narrow-minded uh, local perspective, overlooking all other broader trends and uh, uh, movements. So you have to study micro. Micro history is important. Uh, it sheds illuminating lights. And micro history should be incorporated to macro history. And it should be studied in the context of micro history. So that is the major difference between micro history uh, that was practiced by the analysis historians and uh, historians of Italian school, like Carlo Ginsburg, and the emerging or emergent practice of local history, which needs uh, unconventional sources and innovation, a new methodology and innovative methodology that is also evolving. So thank you for calling, inviting me to uh, talk uh, at your international webinar today. Thank you all. Thank you for all. Uh, if any doubt, please ask, uh, because I have to go to ex exam. Okay. There's an exam due today. <laughs> okay, Professor Shinas, your lecture was wonderful and was quite enlightening. As Professor, how, how many questions you are going to entertain, Professor Shinas? What? How many questions you are going to take? Okay, you ask. I see. I see that. Okay, sure. Then, okay, then participants, you can ask questions directly or you can type as you did yesterday. There are two options because he's busy, he, he has examination duty, so you, you ask. I have, to, I have to reach the one, one, one hour before because of the COVID problem. Okay, okay sure. So, okay, then. Uh, so, so, questions, okay. if any, two or three questions, I will uh, suddenly answer. Okay. Otherwise, so. Otherwise, I'm always available. You can ask any questions. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Today, you are going to take only three questions, okay? Uh, okay, then. Okay, then there is a space for three questions. You can ask as early as possible because he has some uh, some other duties, like examination duties. So, you can ask him directly or first you unmute and ask Professor Chinas directly or you can type in the message box as you did yesterday. You, you ask directly, that is better. So be quick. He is waiting for your response. Dear participant, this is a question hour session. You have two options. I it's better you ask directly or you can type here. I can convey the message to him because he has some other duties, examination duties. So be quick. Today we have only uh, space for three questions. Then I, we can share his uh, email ID. But then you can contact him later. So today there is space for three questions. So be quick if anyone have doubt. That section is about like a micro history, especially the local history. Then trying to connect the local history with the, the macro and other sort of things. So, uh, so local local history is a very trendy thing in these days in Kerala. So you definitely have question. You, so so be quick.
Hello, any questions? Okay, there, there is one question like from Aditya Pradhavan, Professor Shinas. This is a question. Will local history come under subaltern studies? Professor Shinas, this is a question from Aditya Pradhavan. Will local history come under subaltern studies? Local history subaltern studies will will local oh, okay. uh, coming 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 okay sure uh, excuse me yeah uh, local is... uh, local history and subaltern history subaltern history which emerged in 1982 with the publication of subaltern studies volume 1 uh, edited by ranit guha and uh, other participants like uh, partha chatterjee shahid amin gyanendra pande etc subaltern studies focus is entirely different. So if you go through the first, first volume of the first introduction, introduction of the book, Ranadit Kuha writes, what is the aim of, what is the objective of subaltern studies? He, like a slogan, he proclaims that the historiography of Indian nationalism has been dominated by two types of elitism. One is colonial elitism, and the other is bourgeois nationalist elitism. The subaltern struggles, which were violent and spontaneous and independent of the elite, were not included in the mainstream historiography. That is colonial, neo-colonial, national, neo-national, and even Marxist historiography. So they wanted to restore the position, the struggles, the contribution of the subalterns towards the national movement in historiography. Local history's focus is entirely different. This, these two are uh, different, different approaches to history. And in, uh, in local history, you can study uh, subaltern local history. That is another point. You can, you can invent a term, subaltern local history. That, that type of local histories has, uh, uh, have been doing in many parts of Kerala. Yesterday, I talked with uh, eminent scholar Jay Deviga uh, for our talk. Uh, we are going. To, uh, we are. It is scheduled to be uh, held in December, and she was talking about deprivation, abjection, and dispossession, about uh, uh, Dalit slum, and and. Uh, uh, fishing hamlet in Tiruvandamiram, two slums, two areas, uh, exclusively based on oral historical sources. So that comes under the uh, uh, subaltern local history. You can, if you, you wish, the, wish, wish to term like that. Otherwise, the major focus of subaltern history and local history are entirely, is entirely different. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your answer, Professor Nas. Then, any other questions? Participants, please. He's waiting for you. There is space for two more questions. There is space for two more questions. Be quick. There's another question from Jasmine Rosanil. Sir, sir, the source of local history is mostly oral. Justice reduce historicity. I repeat again. Or uh, I uh, repeat it. Oral okay. history as a source of history. The source of local history is mostly oral. That's that's a okay. statement. The source of local history is mostly oral. Then justice yeah. reduce historicity. That's the point. No, this is an off, uh, this is an often asked question. Uh, what is actually an oral source? I am delivering a lecture today in front of you. That is, I am orally delivering a lecture. Suppose if this lecture, uh, any newspaper carries my, uh, carries my the contents of my lecture, lecture tomorrow, it would, it, it would become a written source. So all written sources are initially oral sources. They were written later. 
whether it is inscription, inscriptions are ordered by kings. They are orally transmitted to the uh, inscribers. So all, all written sources are in fact uh, oral sources initially, and they became written sources after. For example, uh, the proceedings of the parliament, we are hearing live it on television, orally. And the next day we are reading it uh, as a document. <laughs> that is the difference. But when we do for oral history, when we question, uh, when we uh, uh, prepare questionnaires and interact with the people for information, you have to be cautious and you have to take some uh, procedures, uh, historical method like procedures to chisel out, to separate or differentiate between fact and fiction, exaggeration and belittling, romanticization and otherwise, etc. That is a laborious process. So you cannot take, in, uh, take it as granted as true. Every, every uh, uh, every participant's account uh, of an event or memory, you cannot take it, take it for granted because you have to apply your mind, your internal criticism and external criticism you practice in historical method that you have to apply and separate the grain and the uh, other thing. So for legends, for example, legends is a very uh, good source for local history. Legends are in fact, in fact not history, but legends contain history. So what is history in the political legend? Parashurama legend is an uh, interesting fiction, a legend, but it contains history. That history we have to retrieve. That is the point. So oral history is very important, including legends. So uh, the main task of the historian is to differentiate the oral historical accounts, veracity, truthfulness. For that, we have a procedure. So please read Paul Thompson's and uh, uh, the other man's name I forgot, uh, uh, edited work, Oral History Reader. It is an essential work for doing oral history. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Viewer Fred. And I got Jasmine got the answer she expected. So then okay. there is one more question. There is space for one more question. Be quick. There is space for one more question. I hope there is no other questions and time is up. And I invite Professor Jinsi Asafo out of thanks. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, myself, Ms. Jinsi Asar. I am here to propose a word of thanks. As you all know, we are on the second day of the international webinar. Today's the first session was indeed a very vibrant and knowledgeable one. We are really enlightened with the knowledge and presence of uh, our honorable resource person, uh, Professor A. N. Shinath. On behalf of the participants and Department of History, Kaish College in Nalgoda, I extend our sincere gratitude to Professor Shinath. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to thank uh, our principal, Reverend Dr. Jody Andrews, for his uh, enthusiastic support. Thank you, Father. I take this opportunity to thank our Honorable Vice Principal, Dr. K. Y. Shaju, for his esteemed presence uh, and uh, kind words. Thank you, sir. We would like to extend our sincere gratitude and appreciation to all the participants for the active participation and cooperation throughout the session. Thank you all. A special thanks to Dr. Binu and John and all other staff members for their support. Finally, uh, a heartfelt thanks to all those who have directly and indirectly contributed uh, to this webinar. Thank you all. I conclude my words once again. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, thanks, uh, Prof. Agency. There is an announcement. Uh, our, our international webinar second session is over. There is one more session uh, today evening, 7 o'clock. So it will be uh, through Google Meet, not through uh, Zoom. So anyway, we will inform you. We will send the link, then kindly join. The lecture is going to be done by the uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Manoj Kumar P.S., Head of Department of Government College, Kutanilu. So, see you then. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for your cooperation. Thanks for coming. Thanks for thanks all. Have a good day.